Welcome to the Continuum Lab. Today we're doing something a little bit different. For the past couple of months, while I've posted zero new videos to this channel, I have been working on my main project, which is the Continuum Lab Instrument Kit, or K-L-I-K for short, CLICK. The CLICK is a DIY kit for making MIDI instruments, which I've been developing and uh, testing for some time now, and which you will soon be able to buy. The DIY kit, Continuum Lab Instrument Kit Breakout Boards, or CLICK for short. So lately I've been ironing out some problems and trying to incorporate some new ideas and in this video I'm going to tell you about a couple of those new ideas, one of which has turned into what I now consider one of the key concepts in the click and which I'm super excited to share with you. The main thing is that the Teensy LC microcontroller which comes with the kit will be pre-programmed with a sketch that has the code for a bunch of different instruments which you will then be able to build straight out of the box even if you have zero knowledge of coding. On the other hand, the Teensy board is of course compatible with Arduino, so if you have the skills and you want to change or adapt the code, which is open source, or even write your own, then you can just go ahead and do that. The no coding aspect is meant as a helping hand to those who are just starting out, and maybe as a stepping stone to understanding code and figuring out how to write your own. So in order to put all of this together, I'll obviously have to make a bunch of instruments and then fit the code for each one of them into some kind of monstrous multi-instrument sketch, which is in fact exactly what I've been doing. The first four test instruments are ready and they're based on the ones that we make in the Continuum Lab workshops, which are capacitive keyboard, recorder type MIDI instrument, electronic bass guitar, and membrane percussion kit. These are proven designs that I know very well and they're specifically meant to be quick and cheap to build. Also, they nicely represent four different instrument groups, which means that they make a good uh, starting point for my multi-instrument sketch. But I'm not using these ones exactly because they're all based on an earlier version of the click with a different breakout board and different connections. Instead, I made some new ones and while I was at it, I also took the opportunity to try out some new ultra simple fabrication techniques for the Continuum Lab workshops, which turned out to be quite interesting. So there's a lot going on in this video and I apologize if it gets a little bit confusing, but I am covering months of development which didn't have a script at the time. For example, as I was making the first couple of instruments using the old breakout board, I was also designing and then ordering the new board, which arrived as I was finishing up and then had to be incorporated. So it's all a bit messy, but the good news is that it's all working now and that's what I'm so excited about and that's what we're going to see in this video. So let's roll the build footage and I'll explain as we go along. The new techniques that I was talking about have to do with the desire to establish a kind of baseline for how simple I'm able to make these instruments in the sense of both materials and difficulty. For example, in the case of the recorder, the mouthpiece and pressure chamber is now basically one piece made out of a bottle top, a single balloon and a rubber band, eliminating the food grade silicone tube that I used before, which is something many people probably don't have lying around the house. But the main change to this design and the others is that I'm making all of these new prototypes without any soldering. This is first of all motivated by the fact that the target audience for my Continuum Lab workshops is basically primary, middle and high schools in my area, so kids starting at 9 years old and up. That's why it's important for me to set the entry bar as low as possible, which ultimately means getting rid of the soldering iron. So in this case that changes the way that I make the keys. With the Teensy, the capacitive keys are really as simple as just a cable with something conductive at the end. And it turns out that a thumbtack plugged straight into a DuPont cable and covered with sellotape makes for an excellent key sensor for this kind of wind instrument. In fact, it works so well that we'll be revisiting this concept for the next couple of instruments. Oh, and I almost forgot. I want the Click software to allow some of these instruments to be made without using the breakout board. So that's what I'm doing for this one. It allows for a much more streamlined design, especially for tube-shaped instruments such as this. So, some aspects of this new design are promising, but it'll need some more fiddling before it's ready for the workshops. Anyway, it works for now, so let's move on. I think not having to know how to solder will be great for complete beginners and important for children especially, for basic safety reasons. I mean, you can definitely teach a nine-year-old to solder Okay, more realistically, you can definitely teach some nine-year-olds to solder, but I just don't have time to supervise that process in a workshop with a group of 25 kids. And then little Timmy burns his eye out and now I'm in trouble. So that's why we're not soldering today. Anyway, on with it. 
Next is the keyboard. Here I decided to change two things. First of all, I wanted to make this version smaller because the keys on the original are very much for adult sized hands. Just scaling it down somewhat worked fine for the functionality, but now it's actually kind of hard for me to play using my fat adult fingers. Also, it ended up being quite a challenge to fit all the cables and stuff inside at the end. So I really can't recommend this change at all. I plan to stick to the original size from now on. The other change, again, has to do with soldering. The copper tape keys on the original keyboard are also capacitive, and so each is soldered to the stripped end of a cable. Now, to make a non-soldered connection between the cable and the tape, one way would be to just lay the bare cable across the copper and then glue or tape it down. But I found that this kind of connection is quite unstable because the bare strands of cable have very little surface area and are quite hard to control. A more sturdy connection is easily achieved by again using a thumbtack to drastically increase the surface area of the cable end and then folding the conductive side of this metal tape back across it. Another cool thing about this solution is that I can now use aluminum tape, which is much cheaper than the copper stuff, but which I haven't used in the past because it's really hard to solder to, so that's a nice added bonus. Finally, we'll cover everything and hold it in place with a strip of packing tape. It's not exactly pretty right now, but it does work surprisingly well. All the same, we'll cover it up later with some nicer tape. Again, some aspects of this design are great, and some other ones not so much. Anyway, it works, so we'll move on. By now, I'm sure you understand that I'm not aiming at any kind of minimum aesthetic level here. I'm going for functionality and minimum functionality at that. What I really need is just a test platform for the Click Electronics and Sketch, and that's what I'm making, nothing more, as you're about to see with this next one. Next up is the bass guitar. Unlike the previous two, the main body of this instrument hasn't changed at all from the original, but what has changed completely is the design of the string sensors. The old version relied heavily on matches as a material, yes, standard wooden matches. By wrapping them in copper tape and soldering a cable to them, then covering with tape or heat shrink tubing, I was able to make some decent, capacitive, roughly string-shaped sensors. But the surface area on these was a bit on the low side, which affected the sensitivity, and of course there was soldering and special materials involved. So to try to solve this, I came up with a new cardboard-based solution. Each string section is now folded out of the same corrugated cardboard that the body is made from. I'm using two different shapes, one for the fretboard section and another for the plucking sensors. The copper tape goes all the way around these triangular shapes and then just like with the keyboard, I'm using the thumbtack DuPont cable combo to make the connection, gluing down the sensor strips on top without gluing over the actual thumbtack, of course. The plucking section string sensors turned out a bit weird if I'm being honest, so those will have to be changed before I use this in my workshops. But even so, this setup should actually work just fine, so we can move on to the last instrument. So in between filming the build of the bass guitar and the membrane percussion, which is next, I received some packages. First of all, my new lights arrived, so now I won't have to depend on getting good light through my window, and hopefully we can all enjoy some more consistency lighting-wise in my videos in the future. I also received my new Click breakout boards, so for this next instrument I can install the correct one right away, which is just easier. Let's do it. The membrane percussion is a bit different than the others, in that the original design already doesn't require any soldering. Instead, it relies on the CNY70 sensor modules included with the Continuum Lab instrument kit and which plugs straight into the breakout board, now using separate cables for the connection. This is a much more sturdy solution than what I used before, which was cables soldered directly onto the module, which tend to break if they're flexed repeatedly. As far as the design itself, all I really want to change is the base of the instrument, which is needlessly complex in the old design. So let's just make an open box shape like the one for the keyboard, which is easy to make and quite stable. That way we can put the individual drums on top and have much better access to the electronics inside than before. The drums themselves are also a bit different, in that I'm using these circular pieces to make the bass for each. Like always, in order for the edge of the drum to withstand the pressure from the membrane without deforming, it has to be strengthened. I find that hot glue is good for this, just make sure to get a bit into the holes of the cardboard as well as on the surface. When it sets, it forms a hard, solid edge even on this quite soft cardboard. If you have a better raw material, you can probably get away with a bit of sellotape around the edge instead. That's all of them. Now we're back in the present and I just need to swap out the old breakout boards and these for the new ones and then I'll show you how they work. 
I actually made a mistake when ordering these boards. The uh, Continuum Lab instrument kit abbreviates down to KLIK or CLICK, which I like because it sounds like something that's easy and accessible, as in things that click together or an idea that finally clicks. But on the back side of this new batch of boards, I managed to overlook what I consider to be a hilarious typo. So, obviously I won't be selling these specific boards, although of course they are still fine for testing and for my own builds here on the channel. Anyway, luckily I'm working with very small batches right now, so it wasn't a huge loss. Okay, that's the breakout boards installed, and now everything is up to date as far as the electronics go. You might have noticed that I didn't actually plug in any microcontrollers on the breakouts, and that's of course because that's the test that we'll be performing right now. We want to see if a single Teensy LC with a single sketch on it can transfer across all of these instruments and make them all work correctly. So we'll start by uploading the sketch to the recorder and then if that works, we'll take the same microcontroller and move it to the other instruments one by one without any reprogramming along the way. I will cover the software for this in much more detail and share it under an open license once I'm a little bit further along in the process. That will be happening fairly soon. So actually, if you made it this far in the video, you should probably hit the subscribe button so that you don't miss all of the cool stuff coming through the Continuum Lab pipeline in the near future. For now, we'll just upload this sketch here and see what happens. Then I'll close down Arduino just to make clear that we're not uploading any more code after this. Okay, let's see. In order for this to work at all, every click instrument must have a calibration button. That way the sketch can adapt to stuff like my weird DIY capacitive sensors, which can vary a lot in range. So the way it works is, we hold the button down and then activate all the sensors one by one. The LED on the Teensy lights up while this is going on, so you know that everything is working. Now I'll connect to the software synth and <laughs> Great, that works fine. This breath sensor is extremely sensitive. Check it out. <laughs> I'll remind you that the sketch itself does not know anything about the range of readings we get from these keys. So that means that if I reset the chip by unplugging the USB, then it forgets the calibration. <laughs> okay. However, in this latest version of the click, I have solved this issue by using the EEPROM memory on the Teensy to save calibration data. We'll do this by first calibrating again, of course. Let's test that. That's fine. And now we press the calibration button three times like this. The LED on the Teensy will blink three times so that you know it worked. And now all the calibration data has been saved. So let's do another hard reset and see what happens. Nice, now it's working. All the calibration data is still there. And that's the same setup for all the click instruments, so let's check that out. We'll have to unplug all the cables from here, which is a bit of a mess since we're not using the breakout board. Then remove the Teensy, and then we can plug it in over here on the keyboard, if we can find our way in through this rat's nest. So, just a second, I hear someone say, how does the instrument sketch even know what instrument it's in? And that is indeed a very good question. Let's have a look at the breakout board and I'll show you how that works. Down here in the settings section on the board, we have three sets of pins. The rightmost mode pins is where we select the instrument group that we're in. There are four options, wind instrument, keyboards, plugged instruments and miscellaneous, which includes our percussion instrument. We're dealing with the keyboard right now, so we'll mark option 1 by simply inserting a jumper in this position right here. Next section defines the instrument within the group, which in this case is number 0, the simplest 16 key capacitive keyboard. So we leave the instrument section alone with 0 jumpers, which means 0. The final section on the left is for activating options specific to each instrument. 
For this one, we want these two sensors here to work as a pitch bend sensor. So we'll insert a jumper in this pin here. I'll obviously cover this in much more detail in future videos, but for now that should suffice. Let's do the calibration routine and see if it works. Again, we'll select a suitable instrument. Great, that works quite well. Let's try the pitch bend. Nice, the calibration is good. Let's try and save it like before. And then reset. Yes, that still works just fine. Let's move on to the bass. Now you know how it goes, so we can be a bit quicker about it. We're still just moving the same Teensy LC from one instrument to the other, no reprogramming or other tricks involved. The settings section for this instrument looks like this. Instrument number zero in mode number two, which is for plucked instrument. No special options selected. So let's calibrate. and select an instrument. Cool! The sensitivity on the string sensors works just like on the old one, so I'm able to control dynamics. Let's test the memory. Okay, nice. So that also works great. Let's move on to the last one. Remove the Teensy from here, and plug it in over here, calibrate everything. Let's select a drum kit for this. Nice. Again, like the keyboard, this is a velocity sensitive setup. But there is another option for having continuous control over volume on each drum. Anyway, we'll get into that some other time. For now, I think it's safe to say that the Continuum Lab Instrument Kit Multi-Instrument Sketch concept actually really works, which is very exciting. For now, there's just the four instruments, but there will be a few more before I actually start selling the kit. At least eight, but possibly more. And further down the line, definitely many more. And that's all for today and really I guess we're more or less caught up on what's going on with the Continuum Lab instrument kit. Now I can get on with sharing the development more in real time which will be nice. So if you want to make sure that you don't miss any of that then don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications and all that good stuff. Take care until next time. I'll see you in the Continuum.